Welcome to the Gifted Neurodivergent Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the exploration and cultivation of the outside genius found in neurodivergence. Welcome to the Gifted Neurodivergent Podcast. My name is Lauren Skinner. Today I'm here with a writing coach, Jemima Acevedo, who is going to talk with me about her creative process. Joanna, welcome. I'm a writer, editor, and educator. Um, I live in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I received my MFA in fiction from NYU in 2021. And since then, I've been working as an editor and a teacher uh, and in a variety of roles. Basically, since 2018, I've worked in every job in independent publishing in that time period, um, from sales rep to event coordinator to social media management. And Lillian and I met through a service that matches uh, writing coaches with clients. I've done almost everything through that service. I've ghostwritten college papers, and I've helped people work on their book manuscripts. So it kind of runs the gamut of different uh, things that I've done. And one of the reasons I got paired with Joanna, because I actually went through a few before I got to her, was that Joanna has the unique ability to make it so that my writing, which I know is like all over the place because my brain is very big picture and I skip around. She's very good at funneling it down and making it so that it will hit the biggest audience because I really struggle with that because I am an outlier. And she has somehow managed to figure that out. And that is an incredibly valuable thing to be able to figure out. So I asked Joanna to come on the podcast because I really think that we have not talked to people who are incredibly profoundly talented and we have only focused on this tiny small group that tends to be boomers and the boomers are not the future. I actually think Joanna is a typical person that will be successful in the future. I would say she's successful now and we see her doing everything. We see her doing all these different roles. She's flexible. She's quick. She has neurodivergence and she sees it as an asset. We're going to talk today about how does she define herself? How did she sort of find this? How, why did she go in this direction? And so on. And I hope that this will be of value to you because you will be able to see where you start, how you get going. Because Joanna's quite young. She's as young as my son. And she is helping me put out better product. And that's amazing. How would you define yourself as a creative? I do define myself as a creative. I think that Being a creative is probably the most important part of my identity, but primarily a writer. I've done some performance art. My background is actually in visual art. Both of my parents are painters. I have a degree in illustration. I also have two degrees in creative writing. I've done sort of a lot of different things. Writing has always been sort of home for me. Sort of where I touch base is the way that I communicate with the world. So it's always been the way that I feel like I've been able to express what I want to talk about in the most coherent way. And do you find writing helps you sort of collect your thoughts and editing them makes you feel better understood? Yeah, I do think that it's about understanding, but I also think it's also just about processing. I think that I don't understand things until I sort of worked them through in that process but I also think it's about recording I think that a lot of my anxiety comes from the idea that we will not that our lives are sort of meaningless and that we don't have you know we won't be remembered and so I think that the sort of active and also my memory is bad (laughs) Um, but I think that I really like the idea that we can process and record and hold on to these narratives um, in a way that is meaningful to us even if they you know ultimately become nothing So you do feel that it's important to be remembered? I mean, I think we won't be, and it's not sort of the human condition, but I think that there is this sense that as humans, we want to make our mark, and that's just sort of a natural impulse. That's interesting, because I I don't really worry about being remembered, because I figure I won't be here. So you're saying the opposite, so I wonder why you feel that way. I mean, I think that a lot of, and I have a lot of tattoos, so I think that's part of it as well. I think the act of marking time is very important to me. I like the time capsule aspect of it. Like you can look back on writing from different periods of time in your life and be like, oh, I was there. I was, I thought this. And I think there's something kind of magical about that, that you can just sort of hold on to that moment and that it's, it's preserved. Interesting. You don't struggle with your needing it to be perfect and not wanting to show the world then? No, not really. That's awesome. 
I, I definitely struggle with that, especially as a youngster. I'm over it now in my 40s, but when I was younger, I really felt mortified to share it with the world. Why do you think that is? What made you confident in your writing abilities or who helped you see that your voice was worthy of being heard? I mean, I sort of oscillate. I, I go between I'm a genius, I'm an idiot. Right? And I sort of bounce between the two. Right now I'm in an I'm a genius phase. Um, but I think that I, I think that's very common for creative people to sort of move between those two states. And you, you go between like, oh, I'm so technically gifted. I've worked so hard on this. I've spent so much time thinking about this. And then you kind of, you look at it, you know, a few days later and you're like, ooh, I hate this. I can't read it. It's awful. And you just kind of move between those two states. And I think that as you do that, you push yourself forward because you, you think about, you think, oh, I've done this so great. It's so beautiful. I want to share it with the world. And then you sort of look at it again and you're like, ooh, I don't like that. That's real bad. I got to work harder. And I think that's what sort of propels me forward. It's all sort of like swaying between the two things. But I think that in the impulse is to share. And so when you have that feeling like, oh, this is so great, then you share it and you get positive responses. Hopefully you get positive responses. <laughs> but, and then you're able to sort of express and then you go back into the dark place and that's where you sort of live in your hole where you are kind of banging your head against the wall. And that's where you actually make the progress. And that's how you push forward. That's interesting. And then you, and yeah, and then, then you just kind of move back and forth, and that's how that's how you, that's how you keep going. That's the engine of it. And that is very much true. I do believe that that is a very accurate statement. I think that you really beautifully put together what most of our creatives go, and they have pathologized that. But in reality, that is sort of our way of, that's what makes us creative. It's like we're going between our conscious and our subconscious, and our brain is bringing up these emotions, and those emotions are what is actually pushing us between the two brains and sharing the information so that we can create, because creation is really hard. And I think that we have so much in our, our world that focuses on us regurgitating or recreating something someone else has already done before, and we spend all this energy and time and grades and, and all this education on regurgitating information that was already predetermined. And those of us who are creatives, they don't even know how we function. Those of us who are naturally creative, our neurotransmitters, our emotions, our whatever you want to call them, are out there making us the way we are. Our makeup is to create. It gives us energy on this roller coaster ride because in the emotion is the creation. What you just gave is something that I have experienced and everyone I know who's a creative has experienced. And watching them go through that ride back and forth is both fascinating and it's completely pathologized when I don't actually think it's a pathology, but rather a, a way of being. If you were in our natural state, we would probably need those emotions to know if we went into this part of the force we didn't know, or we, we sat there and, and enjoyed ourselves and relaxed because we would have to be on a state of sort of going between relaxing and vigilance. And when do we have that on and when do we have that off? And I think we've lost that in today's society. We don't know when to have it on and off. And so as creatives, we're naturally doing it in our creating. So I want to go back to your earlier question, which is how did I find the, um, the confidence to not worry about sharing? Mm -hmm. um, but I do want to answer your other question, which is that how do we, that we've lost the sort of, the sort of push and pull. Um, I think that we haven't lost it. It's just that it's kind of dormant. Because there are so many creative people who are stuck in that loop, but they just don't have the resources to share what they're doing. Yeah. I have so many creative friends who are desperately trying to share what they're doing and really want to make their voice heard and really want to push forward and just don't have the resources to do it. Looking at your questions earlier, I a lot of it was like how do you make a living? How do you how do you become successful? How do you how do you define success? And part of it is being really creative about how you make money and how you can define a job and how do you figure out what to do. Part of it is allocating resources and part of it is just luck. But in terms of the idea that we've lost this sort of sense, I think that it's really there. It's just on the ground. And if you have to know where to look for it, you have to tap the well. Go to any major city and go to the nightclubs, go to the gay bars, go to the, go to the burlesque shows and 
you go to the streets, just walk around, you'll find things. And you just have to kind of nose around a little bit. It's yeah. there. It's just, it's, it's crying out because it's being destroyed, but it's there. I think our mass public consumption thing kind of got rid of where most local artists had a space to make a living. I know for my parents, you said your parents were painters. My parents were actually musicians. They would show up and do like concerts or whatever for the local community, but they were really grossly underpaid. And a lot of times they were asked to do it for free. And there's this idea that artists aren't really valuable in our system. And that's going to change. I really, truly believe that's going to change. And I also want to welcome your friends to come on the podcast if they want to talk about their performance and their art and we'll put up their stuff because this is about being a creative truly creative person that's like making because I do believe that the genius in creativity doesn't necessarily have to be cognitive. I believe it comes out in many different ways. We should be recognizing that giftedness across the board. I think it's valuable for all of us to know what it's like to be creative in the different areas and how you keep going through because it is really hard to be a creative when you don't have an audience that's affirming you or you don't have financial income that's consistent it's hard to believe that it's good or or going to deliver or it's just hard to believe in yourself. And I was with family this weekend watching them really upset with one of their creative children because he was not doing perfectly well in school because he found it boring and he was trying to get out of his work. And everybody at the table was crying over it. And I just used to think, oh my gosh, this is such a horrible thing. And we need these creative kids more now than ever. And we're destroying them. Yeah, and that makes me think of, I'm very lucky in that I did not have pushback when I decided to become an artist. It was really more like normal. It was always just like, you know, some people like are going to be doctors. I was always going to be an artist. Parents did not expect anything else from me. And they were just like, yeah, Joanna's going to go to art school. Like there was no question. They didn't ask. It just, that was assumed. Awesome. And then I did. And then I just became this. That's awesome, though. That's awesome that your parents were like, yeah, of course that you would be that and see how this works. It is a fascinating thing to realize that you just have faith in a child or you have faith in a a young adult to say, I trust that whatever you do, you'll be successful. Here's the money, go. It's a beautiful thing. And I think that that's, you know, a very, it's a leap of faith in parenting, but it's also faith of, you know, saying, I raised you and I know what you're capable of and I trust you and I will, you know, be there if you trip and we'll figure it out. And what brought you to writing versus the fine arts since your parents were painters? Why do you think you ended up in writing versus what they do? I've always had a natural facility for it. And looking back, I was actually much more drawn to it than I was to visual arts, but I didn't kind of get that until I got to be in college and I had a professor who really pushed me. Just sort of took a random intro to fiction class and just like it clicked. But I have always had a natural sort of affinity for it. I was a big reader. We didn't have TV. I was a big, big reader, very fast reader, very natural reader. I didn't start reading early, but I picked it up quickly and I read a lot. And then when I was in college, I had a professor who really, really was like, you have a talent, you need to focus on it. And then I went to grad school and I got into a good school and it was just never questioned after that. Awesome. Do you have cases of the nerves? When you put your stuff out there, you have that vacillating, they're going to reject it. You don't seem to ever, that I've known, you've never seemed to really struggle with keep putting it out there. And I know that that is a real struggle for a lot of creatives, the rejection fear. I'm so numb to it. I've sent so much stuff out. And it's, I've gotten, I get rejections every day. Oh, I have been slacking about submissions recently, but I actually, there's a period where I'm getting rejections like literally every day. And you just shake it off. That's true. When you get that money, you don't even feel it anymore. It really is about sort of getting really comfortable with rejection, isn't it? (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) It's strange how much you can get comfortable with it and keep going. Yeah, I've always been very lucky that I got into graduate school on my first try. I got funding. My book came out while I was still in school, which was not in the indie press, but it was still exciting. I've sort of lived a slightly charmed life in terms of what has happened in my career. I mean, I don't have a full-time job. I work freelance, but it has not been very terrible. 
I have a much easier trajectory than a lot of people. A lot of people, you know, query agents for five years. I've worked on their book for 15 years and nobody cares. Like, it's, I've been very lucky. And so I, I feel like I'm a little bit happy to lucky about it. <laughs> have you had experience with people who are, you're watching them vacillate back and forth and don't understand or you do understand why they're struggling and you're not? I would not say that I'm not struggling. You've really handled rejection incredibly. You've taken it in stride. I'm used to it. I get, you know, rejections constantly. But I do, I have friends who have gotten many rejections and it's a case by case thing. Everybody has their thing and there's different reasons. My grandmother used to say that if you get accepted, it's because you're amazing. And if you get rejected, it's because they are not a good fit for you. Mm -hmm. Like it's not about you, it's about them. Which is, my grandmother is a writer. It's just like one of those things where like, if you get rejected by someone, you can't take it personally. You have to frame it in your head that it's not about you. It's about them not being interested in what, it's not a good fit for them. Can't take it specifically. It's your problem. It's not personal. So I'm sort of able to get over it and be like, it's not because they don't like me. It's because we're just not a good match. I see it as my perspective being either ahead of its time or not the right niche for it or something. I have struggled with my perspective being ahead of its time. And that's been a real actual problem for me where it comes five years later and everybody's like, oh, this new novel thing. And I was like, I was talking about that five years ago and y'all rejected me. There is a timing thing. The closer you are to their average base, the more you're likely to get picked up. Grandmother's absolutely right. There is that ability to step back and see yourself as almost another person or some outside thing that you can say, oh, it's not about me personally, but it's more about this place and the thing I'm offering. And and that is a really hard thing to do. And the fact that you were able to do it so young is astonishing to me, honestly. What do you think contributed to that? A lot of rejection. <laughs> and I also think that it's about consistency. And I think that they tell you a lot when you get literary rejections that if you get personalized rejections to send again, like keep track and if you get notes from editors. But this is really funny. Um, I submitted to a journal four times and got rejected four times. I submitted a fifth time an essay about being rejected by literary magazines <laughs> after that. That's awesome. And I was like, this is the one you want? This is the one? And the essay that I submitted actually had language from their rejection letter in the essay. That's awesome. Okay. They just basically want to hear their own words, I guess. Yeah. But it, like stuff like that, like that kind of stuff brings me joy. And that's what keeps me going. You submit five times, six times, whatever. This is happening more than once. You keep sending them stuff and they send you notes back being like, we really liked this, but it's not a great match for us. Send again. You keep sending. They will take your piece eventually. You can just throw shit at the wall. Some of it's going to stick. Yeah. It is about stepping back from your emotional state and not putting too much into any one article in almost taking what they give back to you and then using that to create something new. And you did that. You did that like exactly where you gave them back their own words. That's an awesome story. Creative way of being is going to be the future. I think that things are going to disappear. We sort of contrived this whole environment where the system set up these educational processes and we all stayed in our lanes and we went and worked for other people. But I'm seeing more and more articles that are saying people are making so much money for their bosses and they're not being hardly compensated in return and they're getting eventually frustrated and going off on their own. I think that we have a dying system. I think it's rigged against those coming in and that's the younger people. And I think we have to really all get in touch with our creative way of being because that will be the future because I don't know that the system's going to be there in the form that it is. And the form that it is is pretty exploitive. And so I don't know that anybody really smart would want to stay in it because you're going to be working so hard. They're going to use all that creative nature to make themselves wealthier and you're going to end up on the chopping block at some point because they don't value creativity. So what advice do you have for people who haven't really grown up with creatives, don't really know creatives? How do they start to get into that space and headspace and in lifestyle? You said you know, going to the cities and living there, but that's not an option for everyone. So what would you recommend otherwise? Read. Read everything that you can possibly read. I think that my problem with this country is the lack of education. And I know that I became an educator, well, because I needed money, but 
I genuinely believe that an English language arts education and enhanced communication skills will make us better at communicating with each other and therefore lead us to lead, lead more fulfilling lives um, because we will be able to express our emotions in a more fulfilling way that will help us with our relationships, which will just be better for us as people. I think that the way that we communicate has degraded and and I don't want to blame, you know, phones or social media or whatever, because I think it's all, it's part of a larger problem. But I think that genuinely, if we were to learn how to write and speak more clearly, we would have better relationships and we would feel better. Um, and I think that it is about education and just, it's, it's such a systemic problem. But um, I think that the more we can encourage people to educate themselves the more the world will improve <laughs> and that, there's statistics behind that there's actual statistics behind that so i'm not just talking out of my ass but like i just wish that people were more curious i wish people wanted less of a quick fix i want i wish people had more inclination to be curious about the world and they don't do you think our school systems contribute to that? Absolutely. There's a lot, but I think that any kind of deviation from the norm is smushed down. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely the smoosh yourself into the middle. And I mean, that's kind of an interesting thing to me because I really truly see the that average consensus thing going away. And yet we we still have a system completely in place that will not move from that. We're taking people who are potentially creative and turning it against them and taking people who need help being creative and never showing them. I mean, it's not even about being creative. It's about being smart. And people aren't rewarded for that. I was, I've, I know I've told you this story before, but I was in third grade and my teacher was lecturing and I was reading a book under my desk and she slapped it out of my hand and it hit the wall. Wow. I was punished for reading. Like, in school, punished for reading. That's an interesting it? story, because when I was a kid, I did the same thing. I read under my desk. I read the entire libraries of every school I ever went to. That's how bored I was. I did. I did also. <laughs> but my teachers did not really call me out on reading under the desk. I think they just knew that was the only way I could sit there. I think it's gotten worse. I think they have actually smacked down on it and now they're trying to oppress the kids more. And I, I think that was sort of what I was witnessing this weekend with the family member was the parents were trying to control him. Teachers were trying to control him and this poor kid is imploding because everybody's trying to control him. Freedom, like be creative, which is like not a bad thing. No, and I do think there's a freedom component. The need to be free as a creative is really important and we have the opposite of that in our systems, painfully. I totally agree. I was punished for reading constantly because I, I wouldn't stop. I could not be stopped. No. I, I had no respect for authority. My parents let me run wild and I just would not listen to anything anyone said, which was a theme in my life after that, but <laughs> would not stop reading. And I was constantly punished. And it's like, you're punishing a child for educating themselves in a school. But it's like, why? This is bizarre. Yeah. Yeah. Why are you in trouble today, Joanna? I was reading. <laughs> I was self-educating. Holy horror. It is like that, though. They really want it to be about their regurgitation, how you regurgitate it in their way. And I was saying recently in another podcast that my middle kid, who is the math savant, she scores in the 99th percentile in English, which is really hilarious to me. When you give her something to write, she writes it in like the least amount of words with the least amount of description, with the least amount of everything. And she does it exactly to the T that you tell her to, but she does not do any flair, anything extra. And and my other two kids are the opposite, where they will write excessively long, voluminous sagas when they're just needed to write a short one paragraph thing. <laughs> and they get lower grades than her. And I think every time, what is the purpose here? We're just conditioning them to create what they were told to create, not actually to create. Yeah. That's, that's terrible. God, I hate this whole system so much. I know. It really is a messy horror, but I think my goal is to try to give that other perspective where you can create it and that the fact that you are pushing back on it is actually a sign of your intelligence. It's a sign of your gifts. And it's a sign that you're more prepared than most for the rest of the future because the future will be about creating it. I think AI will help us 
be able to fill the, the gap between those of us who have brains that are such far outliers. And I agree with you on the communication thing, but I struggle personally because the way my brain sees the world is so big picture. And when I tell people how I see it, a lot of times they just look at me like I'm crazy. My way of seeing is big picture and we have siloed so much in our system and people don't know what's next to them essentially in the science or they're in their very specific niche. AI is going to give us all of those little tiny niches and all that information that the demand will be for us to kind of pull the wide things together. And we are not A, teaching people how to do that, and B, it's almost as if we're pretending it's never going to happen even though it's already happening. Hmm. I'm a micro person. I'm not a macro person. Actually, I don't know if that's true because I can do developmental edits on a book pretty easily. I understand how writing works. I only understand how writing works. I don't know how the world works. I can't understand politics. I don't know anything about math. I can't do anything. I can do writing and reading, and that's it. Hyper-specialized. I think, although, you're quite young, though. You're still in your 20s. You're... You're in your early twenties too, so you're. I'm twenty six. Yeah, you're. You're still. You still have so far to go, and realize that you have hyper specialized of your own volition, and you've gone into that. But you're. You will broaden now. You have your whole rest of your life to broaden that. Yeah, and because you're such a reader, it will naturally occur. I'm suspicious. I mean, when we're younger, we're taught to be specialists. We're taught to go into that one thing and pick it. But when you get older, you'll find that. You, especially the creatives, we tend to create our own unique sort of space in the world and marry the things that we've learned and gone into. And that's what makes us harder to control, but it also makes us incredibly outside the box novel thinkers. And AI is going to now explode that because every question I've ever had, I can ask AI and get the consensus, then build my case around that. And that was the hardest thing before is I didn't have that. What is your experience with AI and are you using it? And do you see any potential of it for your future? I used it a little. I hired my dad as a hack to help me figure out how to use it. Because um, he works in information technology, or did work in information technology, so he knows a lot about, he knows a lot more about computers than I do. But he has been working on it for me and has given me some really interesting things. I used it for a project that I was working on for Write by Night a few months ago and found it semi-helpful. I still had to go through a lot of data on my own and sort of, it was, it was okay. I think if I asked it better questions, I would have a better answer, but semi okay. I'm working on creating a course right now. I'm, I'm saying that I'm working on it. Really, I've written the syllabus and that's it. Not even the syllabus, I've written a synopsis. It's in the process of, and you cannot take this idea of a chat GPT workshop for writers that work, attacks writer's block, uh-huh. where you can put in part of your story or even just ask it for like a list of nouns or a list of adjectives or something that would kind of help you jumpstart yourself as like a generative workshop to sort of get yourself going if you have a problem in your story and see if like AI can kind of hack it. So I'm working on that and I'm hopefully going to teach that in in the winter. I'll take it. That sounds like a cool one to do. I'm actually building my own AI. I'm training an AI to, to write essentially my stuff for me because I like to talk, but writing is harder for me. It's harder for me to sit still for too long. I love reading. I actually intend to make it be my writer for me. I'm training it so that it only knows me. And then it has like some basic knowledge of grammar and spelling and stuff like that. So I don't have to worry about that too much. See, I could do that for you pretty yeah. quickly. Yeah. If you sent me all the information, I could just kind of knock it out in a couple hours. Yeah, you don't know how much information I have though. I have so much information. It would take you probably months to do it all. I mean, I am worried that it's going to steal my job eventually, but I think that I have a nuanced enough understanding of indie publishing and resources that I'm still providing in a specific service. I don't worry it's going to take your job. The way I see it is I want to build a network of people who are, are doing what you're doing. Like there are a bunch of coaches who do multiple sort of roles because I see the future of the system going away and or it just getting so prohibitively expensive. And even right now with my my middle kid, she's in college, but she's technically in high school, but she's taking only college classes for high school. So she'll graduate from high school and college at the same time. (laughs) The thing that I'm finding is I'm not hiring any one school to give her this degree. She's actually gonna be pulling from three different colleges. And we have art teachers and other teachers who are outside that are gonna come in and do it. And we're like kind of cobbling together this education that fits her creative 
intellectual style and then also is challenging enough for someone like her. It's fascinating in a way because I really do see this being the future for everyone. I see that we're going to have networks that are are mostly coaches and I think we're going to go to that portfolio thing where people are going to be like an artist no matter what they do because AI will take care of most of those basic things like the grammar, like the make this a little bit more concise or whatever, but you, you will now be teaching them how to use a combination of the AI, but also how to use their emotions. Because as I said before in my podcast that I believe we are emotional learners. We use our emotions to guide us. And when I was reading as a kid, I would pick my next book with some sort of theme that was from the one before it because it was like I got into it and I was going down that rabbit hole of that idea. But it was an emotional need. It wasn't this, oh, I'm logically only thinking of this. It was like, no, I have to do this one next. I don't know if you found that as well. I don't think. I think I just read whatever they would give me. Really? I just read them all. Consumed yeah. books. My family, we have a very distinct emotional theme behind all of our stuff. Like you were talking earlier about the, the highs and lows and that being a part of your, your journey. They are definitely extreme part of mine. And I'm not even sure I'd have the energy if I didn't have those highs and lows. Like those highs and lows dictate my life to a certain degree. And I can see that in my children as well. They, they're they dictated. And even with my son, who's in college right now, he's like, I know I should go for psychology, but I really don't care. So I'm going for bio- biological anthropology. And then I'll slap on a psychology degree at the end so I can make some money. <laughs> and I'm like, I know, I totally get what you're doing. Keep going. Because honestly, the psychology degree will give you enough money to make in the short term, but it will be the bi- biological anthropology degree that makes you stand out in the long term. So keep going. Don't worry about it. His sheer want of learning and not actual planning or following the advice of advisors or whatever, because they're still saying, just stick with the one thing. I mean, I got a dual degree BA in writing with a minor in politics and a BFA in illustration, which was a five-year program that I finished in four years because I had an associate's degree from Bard College that I earned in high school while taking overload of credits and I didn't have a lunch period for two years. Me too. I did nine classes in high school, no lunch. Yeah. That's funny. I'm sympathetic to the nerd lifestyle. Yeah. It's an awesome thing to be. I mean it really is going to be the advantage of the futures. So I think the nerds um, nerds rule I guess is the, the takeaway from that. No, I would much rather be highly intelligent and unhappy than happy and dumb. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. I think that if you can be happy either way, it's probably cool. But I don't know too many people that are happy, even smart or not smart. I'm pretty happy. Really? Good. I find that the creatives tend to have no choice but to try to go in the direction of happy. But I find that regular people, like when I visit family or friends that are, I often find that they're pretty miserable. And I was like, wow. I feel so depressed having them out with them. <laughs> That's kind of sad. I have things that are stressing me out, but generally I'm pretty happy. Good. That says a lot for pursuit of being a creative. It says you're fulfilling your needs and the payoff is more than just the financial or the immediate. You have also a long-term sort of satisfaction then. And that's that's awesome. Yeah, I love what I do. I, I really love what I do. Do you find that in many others, or do you find that you're pretty lonely with that, the ability to love what you do? I don't know. My friends are all doing very random things. Um, But yeah, I think most people are not this happy with their jobs. That's really awesome. I mean, that's partly why I brought you on, is that you have expressed that you love what you do, that you're happy, and that I think that the future will be about us being happy over being successful financially or whatever. I I don't see that financial payoff being there anymore and it will be in for really small groups but I don't know that the amount of stress I'm not a person that handles a lot of stress well I did the banking and I did the public accounting for as long as I could and then I was like okay I'm out before I die from stress (laughs) yeah I like a little bit of stress it makes me perform better I get I just I need a little bit of anxiety just to move forward but I'm sort of naturally I kind of I have to buzz a little bit in order to function I think a little bit of stress is, helps us focus, and I, I get that part. There's chronic stress that starts to get in front of your creative abilities, and I want to know, what's your limit for that? Do you, do you notice that? 
Interesting. Um, yeah, there is a there is a threshold. Um, but I will tend to prioritize writing over other things. So if I'm stressed out, I will write before I will do paid work. So you already know how you kind of handle it and and navigate that. That's awesome. That's amazing yeah. how young you are. I will I will prioritize self care over. I mean, self care is such a stupid word, but I will I will like prioritize myself over other people and other things because I need to keep functioning to do the other things. That's awesome. That speaks volumes of your parents because that's an echoist trait that I find too often in artists where they have learned to meet the needs of others over themselves and they are languishing in so much pain and inability to get out of their own way because they're meeting everyone else's needs but their own. Well, I think we should wrap up because we've, we've actually been talking for quite a while and we're about to hit our <laughs> hour mark. But I want to thank you for, for doing this with me because it was really, really insightful and your feedback was really brilliant, honestly. Thanks, Joanna. I really appreciate that you came on and if you want to tell them where they can find you. My website is <laughs> joannaacevedo.net. Um, so please come say hi. I'll put Joanna in the show notes so that you can see how talented she is because she is quite talented. She's somebody to watch. I see great things for her. The views, information, and opinions expressed on this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent Gifted NT Incorporated, Lillian Skinner, or the Gifted Neurodivergent Podcast. This podcast, Lillian Skinner, and Gifted NT Incorporated are not responsible and do not verify the accuracy of the information contained in this podcast series. The primary purpose of this podcast is to inform and educate. The Gifted Neurodivergent Podcast is only available for private, non-commercial use. Any other use of the information contained within this podcast must be done with express written approval and knowledge of Lillian Skinner. You may not edit, modify, or redistribute any part of this podcast. The developer assumes no liability for this podcast or its use on any other podcast or other media.